Ich wünsche einen schönen Abend. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is with really great pleasure that I welcome you very warmly to our book presentation of and discussion about Eva Ilius' book, new book, Undemocratic Emotions of Deutsch im Sorkam Verlag, Undemokratische Emotionen. I do not reveal too much when I say that I have read this book with really great benefit and growing interest reading every page. I promise you, it was the case. It's a fascinating book, and thank you that you have written it. It is about the change of the political right in Israel uh, and the emotions in the background of Israeli society and the way the right uses those emotional the, those emotions with their strategies to employ them for their purposes. Uh, no further spoilers, you will hear about this from Eva. My name is Michael Zürn, I'm director of the Global Governance Unit here at the WZB and have recently worked on themes related to populists and emotions of populists. I will moderate the discussion uh, tonight and I have welcomed you in uh, replacing Jutta Almdinger who cannot be here uh, today. She has to do politics today uh, and she wants me to send you uh, her best regards and I can tell you that she is as excited about the book as I am. So, let me briefly explain how we will proceed. Um, we will start out with a short intro, a short presentation about the book uh, from, uh, from Eva. After this, our discussants, our three discussants, Dr. Elena Kupac, Professor Christian von Schiebe, and Professor Daniel Zieblatt will open the debate with three introductory uh, statements of the book. Um, and Eva then will, of course, come in again with a first response. Uh, I'm sure that this material of uh, those three inputs and the response and the introduction will provide us with absolutely sufficient material for a lively and a good debate uh, about the ideas and the thesis uh, of the book. Uh, and we will do this. We will have a panel discussion on the panel, among the panelists, and then after this, in the last 20 or 30 minutes, the plan is that we open the floor to you, and then you uh, can also come in with your questions. At the very end, I should not forget it, to uh, already uh, point uh, to this uh, right now, there will be some wine and some pretzels outside afterwards, so there's a possibility for ongoing discussions in smaller rounds. I will now introduce uh, Eva and after her introduction, the other panelists. So let me briefly start out with Professor Dr. Eva Ilius. She is Professor of Sociology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and uh, she is also at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris. She was the first female president of Bessalel Academy of Art and Design, and she was guest professor, among else, in Princeton Northwestern, the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin zu Berlin, and the universities of Zürich and Bielefeld. She is, there is no question, the leading scholar on the formation of emotions and their connections to modern capitalist societies, uh, the uh, way emotions develop in capitalism and how it is related to consumerism in uh, our modern uh, societies and also the role of media in the production and transformation of emotional patterns. I could give you now a really long talk uh, why I admire her work very, very much. Um, instead, I just want to give you a selected list of her achievements, uh, and then after this selected list of achievements, you have the word. Uh, her book, Consuming the Romantic Utopia, won uh, a honorable mention for the best book award at the American Social Sociological Association already in 2000. Her book, 
Oprah Winfrey and the Glamour of Misery won the Best Book Award in the American Sociological Association 2005. Uh, she received the Outstanding Research Award of Hebrew University. Uh, she delivered the Adorno Lectures at the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt. In 2009, the German newspaper Die Zeit chose her as one of the 12 thinkers most likely to change uh, the thought of tomorrow. She received the Annelies Meyer International Award for Excellence in Research from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. And her book, Why Love Hurts, won the best book award of the Alpine Philosophy Society in France. I could go on and go on. Uh, you can clearly see this is quite someone. Uh, and we all look forward to hear this quite someone. Thank you, Eva, for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, uh, for this introduction. I always feel like it's not about really me. Um, it's about somebody else. Uh, but I really want to thank the readers for uh, the book. I know how difficult it can be sometimes to read other people's work and comment on it. So really, I very much appreciate the effort you've put into this. So I'm tr going to try very briefly to present the book. Um, the book was researched and written uh, long before, I think, the profound political and constitutional crisis uh, faced by Israel as of April 2023. And tragically, its analysis has turned out to be amply confirmed by the current events. What we can only call a new form of Jewish fascism, proto-fascism, post-fascism, it depends which school you are, is actually in power. And if its program is implemented, it will probably turn Israel into a full-blown religious dictature. It's not clear yet, so we should be careful. It is possible civil society will win and that Israel will return to the status quo ante or not. But whatever the outcome of the crisis, pitting a fascist government with hundreds of thousands of protesters, one lesson can already be learned and it is that populism is or can be the antechamber of radical and authoritarian political regimes. So the study of populism has uh, made me go back to a notion I have rejected most of my sociological career, and it is the notion of ideology. Uh, and I have to say that it's the first time I write something and I, 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 I had difficulties writing it. 30 years ago, I thought that believing that some people held false consciousness and that you, the sociologist, could read behind their backs and above their shoulders um, and, and interpret the true meaning of their beliefs, I thought that this was frankly a very crude way of doing social sciences. And maybe it still is. Um, but since then, I have to say, I changed my mind, uh, at least with regard to the phenomenon of populism. And if I wanted to back this change of mind, I would say that for the last 30 years, cognitive psychology has accumulated considerable evidence showing that our thinking is full of flaws and biases. And I would say that sociology cannot ignore these powerful findings, even though sociology and psychology, cognitive psychology are very different disciplines. These biases and errors are more than inherent limitations of our thinking, of our attention processes, and our reasoning processes, which is how cognitive psychologists present them. They are also systematically shaped by the set of ideas that, I, that are spread in society through various 
marketers, advertisers, consultants, organizations, sometimes, as is the case in Israel, funded by conservative and libertarian billionaires who aim to undermine and destroy the welfare state or democracy or progressive ideas. For example, in the case of Israel, Jeff Yass and Arthur Jan Danchik, they should be named, two Jewish billionaires who have funded highly conservative think tanks for, um, uh, forums, for example, the Kohelet Forum, which masterminded the regime change in Israel. It is a regime change. It is not simply a judicial reform. They masterminded the regime change in Israel, and they are powerful telling examples of the ways in which money distorts and undermines democratic processes. Ideas thus can become ideology when they serve so crudely a very small group at the expense of the majority. And it seems to me that they then deserve to be studied by referring to what I call in the book flawed ideologies. This is an expression by Jason Stanley. The flawed ideologies are very flawed ways of explaining the world, of not updating the information you have about the world. But this is not actually a book about populism, in the sense that I don't try to identify the objective causes of populism. Other books do this much better than this book. I don't really discuss whether increasing inequalities brought about by globalization or whether the uh, cultural gap and divide between educated progressives and non-educated working class explain better populism. I don't either discuss the thesis of political polarization. In fact, I pick and choose from each of these theories without really adjudicating between them to e explain what we call now populist movements. Rather, I was interested in what I may call the emotional style of populism, uh, a, a style that is, I think, actually imitated by leaders throughout the world, leaders who know each other, who copy each other, and are friendly with each other. Orban and Netanyahu and Bolsonaro and Putin, and of course the unforgettable Trump, have, I think, somewhat similar styles. Although, I mean, I would say that Putin is also in a league of his own. So, this style is one that manages to generate very strong identification with their leadership through four central emotions, which I analyze in the book. Fear, disgust, resentment, and love. These emotions do not stand on their own, but are organized through what I call following a sociologist, an American sociologist, Arlie Hochschild, I call deep stories. And deep stories are stories that describe and explain the social world and do not have to be true, they just have to feel true. And these stories are deep because they stick and they circulate widely despite, quite often, contrary evidence. So, these stories would explain why, if you're a Jew of uh, Mizrahi origins, that is, a Jew from Arab countries, and you're poor, why you are poor while a Jew of Polish or German origins is rich and educated. Why the left-wingers who live in Tel Aviv care more, for example, about Arabs than they care about you. Deep stories encode social emotions. Social emotions are emotions which are reactions to social situations. That is a social emotion. They give them intelligibility. 
And emotions in turn motivate the stories we tell and repeat to ourselves and to others. Just think, for example, of the ways in which repeated humiliation create and will produce a consistent story. And so this is how, so I was really interested in how certain emotional and narrative commitments to the world come to acquire an overwhelming character of truth. That's, in fact, I think, the topic of this book. And some emotions come to saturate so much the political arena that they obfuscate facts, evidence, and even self-interest. And I'm completely aware that people will argue with me on that. So we, we see this now, despite overwhelming evidence that Israel will see its economy and security, and security seriously jeopardized if the government stays on course, this path is still preferred by a very large part of the population. All the evidence is here, but it cannot, in fact, override prior emotional commitments and the stories that are attached to them. That's the, really the topic of the book. So, I have devoted much of my academic life trying to analyze the economic and sociological and cultural forces shaping emotional life. And in this book, I, you know, I was a bit tired with myself and I wanted to shift a bit my analysis to new realms, uh, to that of politics. Um, I have to say also I wrote the book because I was just um, concerned. Uh, I was a concerned citizen, as we say. And I wanted to explore the world of meanings of the extreme right through the emotional narratives they deploy to make sense of the world. And so these four emotions of fear, disgust, resentment, and love actually, for me, provide a kind of grid that I apply to the Israeli context, but which can be applied um, by um, changing the um, content of it, the context of them. But I think it can be applied in other places as well, but that can be discussed. And I analyzed each one of these emotions in the book separately because each of these emotions have their own phenomenology. But these emotions, I think, have an internal architecture. That is, they have corridors leading from one to the other. These, corridor, these corridors, I think, although I'm not sure, I'm just now, you know, I was trying to advance my own thinking for this presentation, and I think they depart from a central foyer or living room or central hall or entry hall, whatever you want to call it. And, <clears throat> And what, <clears throat> what would be this foyer? The foyer would be the fact that the majority no longer wants to live with the minority, or at the very least, share its resources with it. If I had to just narrow it down to one central core that animates this thing, I think it would be that. Um, more exactly, I think that one of the cores of Israeli illiberalism or proto-fascism or post-fascism is the resistance to universal citizenship, which you may say, to start with, was never really applied in Israel. That's true enough, but at least there was a kind of facade of trying to apply it. And I want here to quote... Um, this is a quote that's not in the book. None of this is in the book, actually. Um, I want to quote an, a Hungarian public intellectual, Gaspar Miklos Tamas, who says, everywhere from Lithuania to California, immigrant and even autochthonous minorities have become the enemy and are expected to put up 
with a diminution and suspension of their civic and human rights. I think this is very much the case in Israel, where the 19... 48 war and subsequent declaration of independence never brought a final, decisive, definitive victory over the autochthonous Arab Palestinian population. And I think that from this core problem, actually, um, uh, populism, the populist strategy of Netanyahu um, um, was deployed. Fear, fear is the emotion which Netanyahu has relentlessly used to mark Israeli Arab citizens, left-wingers, and Palestinians living beyond the Green Line as enemies, for example, by Nazifying Palestinians. I'm sure you're aware of that, uh, Netanyahu suggested that it was Al-Husseini, the Mufti Al-Husseini, who whispered the final solution to Hitler. And fear leads to an implicit justification of securitism, which I think is a mode of, govern a mode of governance, which very much characterizes Israel, uh, a mode of governance that translates political issues into problems of security. Disgust, my second emotion, is the emotion that best keeps social groups separate. And it has to do with the distinction between the clean and the dirty, the pure and the impure. And in the last two decades, Israel has seen the burgeoning of what I call new normative entrepreneurs or new disgust entrepreneurs, whose vocation has been to change the values and content of liberal morality. If we understand liberal morality as universalist, as viewing all human beings as equal, as aiming to foster fair relationships between majority and minorities, and which also believes in the, therefore, also in the separation of religion of, and between religion and state, these new moral disgust entrepreneurs have profoundly changed the content of the public sphere by promoting disgust of specific social groups. Um, so you have all kinds of NGOs and rabbis who teach in pre-military schools uh, whose discourse I analyze in the book and <clears throat> who basically view um, mixed couples, that is, uh, Jews and non-Jews married together, homosexuals, feminist women, reform Jews, non-Jews, and Arabs, all of these as belonging to the category of the polluting. They are um, venom or uh, garbage, to quote some of them. Resentment. Resentment is an emotion that has long been, I mean, since the 19th century, it has been uh, viewed as a key emotion uh, of democracies. But in the book, I, so I analyze it in a double way. I analyze it both as the expression of the deep inequality between the Jews of Mizrahi origins and Ashkenazi Jews on the one hand, but mostly I analyze the shift in the language of victimhood, which, uh, and this, this shift is that the language of victimhood has become increasingly appropriated by people with privilege. That is true also, that is very much true in America uh, as well. And so I look at the ways in which resentment from the underclass, and one may say, the legitimate and justified resentment from the underclass converges and intersects with resentments of very privileged people. For example, settlers who feel victimized and who hold the discourse of victimization, they feel victimized, for example, by the Israeli army or by what they call 
Tel Aviv. It's a kind of very amorphous entity uh, which comes to de designate the Ashkenazi left-wing establishment. And finally, love. I mean, you have to recode those negative emotions into positive and affirmative emotion. And that emotion is love, uh, by which I mean mostly the love of your own people, the love of your nation. Um, and it is a necessary emotion, especially if you want to reject minorities from a larger whole, then you must reaffirm the special superiority and authenticity of your group. And here I use distinctions that have been made by others between inclusive and exclusive forms of nationalism and patriotism. Now, to be sure, these emotions do not emerge ex nihilo. They tap in a pre-existing geography, they tap into historical traumas and collective social experiences. Obviously, I'm aware of that. Um, but these social experiences become inscribed in the political psyche. They become a part of a people's um, identity, political identity, and emotional makeup when they are framed as narratives that are repeated and hammered in the public sphere by various politicians and the various marketers and consultants who work for them, and when they are relayed unconsciously or consciously by print or visual media and by social networks. So, it is this matrix of these four emotions which um, forms, I think, the heart, the emotional heart of populism. And they create antagonism, deep antagonism between social groups inside society, as well as alienation from the institutions supposed to safeguard democracy. This is exactly what we're witnessing now in Israel. And, um, and so that's, in fact, the main, um, I would say, it's a, it's a proposition. This book offers a hypothesis. It offers a grid of analysis to be modified uh, according to the context uh, in which it will be applied. So I hope I have summarized very briefly the contents of the book. Wonderful. I think it was a, a very elegant and eloquent way of summarizing uh, the book and the idea is now that we begin to have a discussion about some of the issues that are raised in the book. And we have three wonderful panelists here. Uh, I start out with uh, Jelena Kupac. She is a postdoctoral research fellow here at the WZB. She received her PhD from the EUI in Florence, uh, and she works on backlash advocacy and also on narratives, emotions, and the contestations of the liberal order, just to name one of her papers. Uh, then we will go on uh, to uh, Christian von Schewe. He is since 2014 a university professor of sociology and head of the department of the uh, social, uh, it at the Free University of Berlin, and he is working on the sociology of emotions. He has been uh, a member of the board of the Collaborative Research Center, Effective Societies, and a research fellow also at the German Institute. Uh, for economic uh, research. Uh, he is also associate editor of the journal Soziale Welt and of the journal uh, Emotion Review. Last but not least, Daniel Sieblatt. Uh, he is Eaton Professor of uh, Political si uh, of Science of Government at Harvard University since 2018 and also since 2020 a director here at the Berlin Social Science Center. You, most of you probably know his book, How Democracies Die and What We Can Do About It. It's a classic in the whole literature about the decline of democracy. The book has been translated according to my information. Uh, it was 25, but I was already corrected. It is 
30 languages by now. Um, uh, it, was a, it was even on the New York Times bestseller list. But we should not forget two other also very, very important and influential books. His uh, 2018 book, Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, uh, did also win a prize, the Woodrow Wilson Prize, uh, for, the back book, uh, for the best book on government. And not to forget, actually, my favorite, Structuring the state, the formation of Italy and Germany, and the puzzle of federalism. Uh, already in 2006, but I think also a wonderful book. Uh, Daniel became member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2023. So these are the panelists here. Uh, three wonderful people, wonderful colleagues. Um, and talking about wonderful colleagues, I start out with Elena. Why don't you go ahead? We thought about each of you roughly five minutes. Roughly five, five minutes. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and discuss uh, this, uh, this wonderful book. I think it's a tremendously valuable book. I think it's a book that um, in a very comprehensive and, and I would say highly persuasive way uses a so socio-psychological lens to tell us something profound about one of the uh, most pressing problems that our democracies now face, and that's, um, that's populism, of course. I did not want to fight with this book, Eva. When I was reading it, I was very, very happy to be taken completely on a journey that you uh, took us with it. So from the get-go, I was really persuaded that um, populism is this potent emotions machine. And I was persuaded that populists have somehow find a way of using several emotions, Eva has already listed them, um, love, disgust, fear, and resentment, and somehow find a way of using these emotions to craft a very persuasive narrative, what is termed as flawed, uh, flawed ideologies. And they have used them in such a way that they allowed populists not only, and this is what really the puzzle, the way you set it up in the beginning, um, drew me into the book. They use these narratives not only to gain power, but actually to stay in power for prolonged periods of time without actually delivering, without actually um, giving any kind of socioeconomic benefits, or real benefits if we think about them in, in the context of normal democracies to their constituencies. And what is more important, many of the policies that these populists enact go directly against the interest of those whom they are supposed, supposed to represent. And then for me, the way you set it up in the book, this was a magic trick in a way. And then the book becomes a journey of how this trick is, um, is played uh, played out. And one of the things that really struck me, and the way I actually read this book, is that each one of these emotions, and in each of the chapters, when you describe it, is actually a process of completely reworking the political field in these democracies. It's just taking the, the, these political fields from, to use Chantal Mouffe's idea of agonism and antagonism, taking it completely in this deep, profound, uh, antagonistic way by designating us and them true people, corrupt elite, superior versus inferior, patriots and traitors. Each of these emotions does this. That was my reading of the book, creating a clear lines between between people. I will not go because I have only five minutes um, and you have already kind of told us uh, about each one of these uh, emotions. I think fear and resentment are particularly uh, interesting. And in particular, this idea that populists can take resentment and offer a kind of symbolic representation. And it's not really a representation which will help certain disadvantaged people, in this case, Mizrahi, Mizrahi uh, Jews, to kind of change their socioeconomic status. It is a very, it is a psychological way where their victimhood is re recognized, where their perpetrators are designated and where protectors are found, with populists and Netanyahu and other parties that, um, Israeli parties being um, the protectors. And when reading this, um, I think you have an argument in the book, and maybe this is something that uh, we can uh, discuss, is that the whole point of populism, now the question is, of course, because it can, it can move into a, a new phase, 
But the whole point here with populism is actually to find problems, to designate blame and so forth, but actually never to resolve anything. It is a political style which seeks to keep population in a constant state of high emotional arousal so that each of these roles is constantly perpetuated uh, in a way. And this, this, this nature of populism, this, this constant kind of doing the, the same, dividing, dividing roles, it seems to me that makes populism extremely difficult to puncture. And I was trying to think while, when I was at the end of your book, and you do offer some kind of, kind of solution, a way, um, fraternity being perhaps an emotion that we can use to change the situation. But I was thinking whether populism, and whether you maybe see it like this, I certainly do see it after reading your book, um, is a machinery that is extremely difficult to puncture. Because roles are divided, anything that opposition does, be it in the context of Israel, although we, we, will, we will see that, or in some other context, uh, populists can read it in this primary key of uh, of who are friends, who are foes, and so forth. So even if we have protests, they can easily be reinterpreted in, the, uh, in those initial, uh, initial narratives. Um, and that being said, the book as a whole has really uh, opened my eyes to many mechanisms of populism. And I must say, I'm uh, intim intimately familiar with the situation in Serbia, so reading this book it was I was applying this book to that uh, context as well. But the book as well has left me a kind of pessimistic at the end. There was this feeling that this thing can be resolved either through a huge political crisis or a kind of political violence. And I would, I would wonder whether this is how you also, also see it. Thank you. Thank you, Jelena. You go on, Christian van Schiebe. Okay, um, yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I would like to join you in, in thanking you for inviting me and uh, Eva for writing this really fascinating book. Uh, I've hardly ever seen something that provides such rich and thick descriptions of the emotions that lots of other people have diagnosed uh, as being features of populism, but this is really an exceptionally rich and deep description of these emotions. So it's really uh, has been a very, very fascinating read. Um, my, my, my comments uh, focus on, on basically three issues. And some of them are comments, and then there's a couple of questions and a point of criticism maybe also that we can carry on uh, into the discussion. So the first thing that I was asking myself when, when, when reading the book and when reading about those uh, four emotions was, is there something else that, else that these emotions have in common rather, uh, or apart from the things that you say that they, are, um, that they fuel populism uh, and that they rely to some extent on these, uh, on these flawed ideologies? And I think, or one of the ideas that came to my mind was uh, whether we can conceive, and I think this is what you actually do in the book, um, to conceive of these emotions as political emotions. Um, and now, what do you mean with political emotions? Uh, with political emotions, I do not mean emotions that simply happen and arise in political contexts, but with political emotions, um, what I have in mind are emotions that have a specific uh, intentional structure. So uh, the, one, one thing here would be that they are joined emotions. They are felt jointly. They are socially shared and jointly felt emotions. And in that, in that sort, they're sort of a collective emotions, if you want, right? And I think, in fact, all, most of the discussions that you do in those books and most of the examples are examples of collective emotions rather than of individual emotions. And I, that, I think that makes them so powerful in a sense. And the second thing is that this other intentional structure is something that has to do with a political community. So it's, it's shared matters of import, shared matters of concern from which emotions arise. And at the very same time, it's not the individual that is sort of the intentional object of the emotion, but it's a political community. It's a group. And I think these two criteria make the emotions that you describe so powerful in antagonizing society and in dividing society into uh, friend and enemy camps. Um, the second uh, point that came to my mind, and I think that, that, that's a little bit more of a, 
of a, of a question or a point of criticism. And that was the distinction that you make between sort of real and actual emotions on the one hand side and then those flawed emotions or imagined emotions on the other hand side. And I had a difficult time to actually tell these apart from each other. Um, why is that? Because um, uh, when we did interviews with right-wing populists in Germany, uh, and what, what we saw in those interviews was a pronounced fear of the Islamization of the Occident. That's sort of a common trope that you see in those interviews. And when uh, our interviewees explained this type of fear, it was anything but um, it was anything but imaginary. It was uh, it was it was as real as it gets. I mean, they were talking about population statistics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, you might still say it's objectively false. It's wrong. But the thing is, does that make the emotion wrong? I think you can have actual real emotions which are based on flawed premises or objectively wrong information, so to say. And I think that is an interesting line that we could pursue. And maybe uh, as a third point, uh, that is just, I think, a question, curiosity thing, and that pertains to your analysis of ressentiment, which I, I think those are excellent examples of this ressentiment in the Schillerian and Nietzschean sense. I mean, this starting from emotions like, uh, I don't know, envy, shame, inefficacious anger, those sorts of things. And they are, that's what we did in our analyses, and then it, it perfectly matches your descriptions. They are then somehow transformed into emotions that are directed at outgroups such as malice, hatred, hostility, uh, resentment proper. And what you typically also see in ressentiment, because it's this, it involves this sense of disvalue or self-disvalue and powerlessness, um, is is a transformation in value or is a value change. It is, uh, some, some use this example of Aesop's fable of the fox and the sour grapes, so that in ressentiment you have this uh, situation where people desire something, but they can't get it for whatever reasons. And then they start to change the value of the stuff that they originally desired to something, ah, it's rotten, I don't want it anyways, right? I can't get it, so it's, it's rotten. Nobody needs it, nobody wants it, we don't want it. And I'm just curious whether you have seen instances of this value change in the interviews. Right, another, the second value change involves a change in, in self-identity from a morally inferior victimhood identity to the morally superior victimhood identity that you describe in a, in a, in a very enlightening way, I think. But I was wondering, what about this other value change? Things that people desire, can't get, and then you see this disvalue thing. Things are perceived as rotten and not worthy of desiring them. Thank you. Thanks. Fantastic, Daniel. Thank you. Yes, well, um, thank you for the wonderful book. Congratulations. And one thing that people haven't commented on yet, but one of the really beautiful things about reading this book is that it's filled with these uh, interviews and the conversations between Ava and the, her respondents, which are just fascinating and really add this texture to the content of the book that just really you know, give you a very concrete sense. And also your questions are great. And, so it's a, and I guess it's kind of unusual. I haven't seen a book where, you, where the interviewer's questions are there along with, the, with your name and the respondents responding. And so just the conversations as well as their responses are, are fascinating. So uh, congratulations. Um, I, I, th I thought I would make a, um, a couple of comments. I mean, I think in some ways the most puzzling uh, one of the most puzzling features of our current period, and also something that I think if we could untangle would be very revealing, is the degree to which these old political configurations for somebody who was, you know, I was born in 1972, so grew up during the Cold War of right versus left, conservative versus liberal, socialist versus conservative, how these all have become so jumbled in our current period. Um, and I remember actually being, I, the one time I've been to Moscow in December 2016, right after the Trump election, I was there for a conference, and I got this email from Tucker Carlson's producer, and I don't know if people know Tucker Carlson from Fox News, a terrible guy, who used to wear a bow tie, a real Reagan Republican, asking me to appear on his show. And I remember feeling kind of embarrassed to tell him, oh no, I'm in Moscow. I sort of thought, you know, he's this anti-Russian guy who would think I'm a liberal Harvard professor hanging out and palling around with communists in Russia. And what's so amazing is that, you know, that was only four, you know, five years, six years ago. And today, you know, he is the prime supporter of Putin and Russia. I mean, you know, 
So these, you know, these categories have all been jumbled. And I think one of the powerful things of this book is that it provides us with a framework for understanding how is it that uh, conservatives in America like Putin, or how is it that Netanyahu can support Viktor Orban despite his anti-Semitic campaigns against George Soros and so on, and how these weird alliances have come about. And, and part of the way they've come about is through these, this matrix of four emotions. So, so I think this is part of the reason I really enjoyed, enjoyed this book. Um, so I have, I have uh, three questions, and they're really centered around the idea of why you know, uh, why, is this, what's, why is this happening? Why is this happening now? And so this pushes you, I guess, in the direction of causality, which you said you didn't, you know, you're not, that, that's not the main purpose of the book, is to provide an explanation for why this is happening. But I guess I, I, I nonetheless, um, I'm not an expert on emotions, uh, so I was interested in the kind of ca the causal story that's behind this. Why is this happening? So, you know, so the first question is, why is this happening now? I mean, it's fear, resentment, disgust, love, these are fixed features in some sense of the human condition. I mean, they're not, they're not fixed, but they're, they're present. So why are they conspiring now? And you said that this happens, in, in your comments, when politicians and demagogues inscribe them into the public sphere. Um, and so this points us, though, to, you know, but this just begs the question, well, w under what conditions do they do this? And so this pushes me to sort of think about contextual variables. You know, what triggers this? And so that you've identified the raw materials in the sense of, of populism, but how do they get activated? And as I read it, it seemed as if using the Israeli context, you had a kind of two-actor model, I would say, in which you know, using the Mizraim and the Ashkenazi Jews as two key actors, there's this kind of resentment of a working class group that's been uh, disenfranchised in some sense historically towards this cosmopolitan elite, and then the Netanyahu or Likud comes along and activates them. So it's a kind of two-actor model. And so when I think about the United States, though, um, which I know better than the Israeli context, you really need, I think, a three-actor model. Um, and so I wonder if this works as a kind of question in the, in the Israeli context, where it's, you know, it's not the two, you know, a two-actor model in the United States would be that you have these kind of white working class voters who used to support Roosevelt, and then gradually they become conservative over time um, and resentful of the liberal urban elite from San Francisco and Boston. So that's a two-actor model. But actually, I think in the US what happened was that you had increased diversification of American society, voting rights to African Americans, and so this other third group, in a sense, emerged on the scene, generating resentment of the kind of lower status group within the United States, a lower status white group. So uh, Du Bois has this phrase, the psychological wage of whiteness. So the groups who gain these psychological wage, wages of whiteness uh, feel status threat, and so then become prime target to be mobilized. So there's a third group. And so I wonder so in the- the third group is the African American? The, yes, exactly. So in the Israeli context, I guess the point would be how important is the Arab population in Israel? How important is the Palestinian population at, as a, as, to provoke the threat that allows the, the Mizraim to be mobilized by Likud and by Netanyahu? So that's a kind of three, it, it, or is that not, is that analogy okay, between the US good. and Israel? The same. So that, that's one point. Um, second uh, related question is why do those with low status, again, Mitzrayim in Israel, um, and they're fearful of their security in all of the ways that you describe, why do they support the radical right? I mean, why do they become resentful? I think this end outcome isn't inevitable. Um, you know, low social status doesn't necessarily mean you vote for the radical right. I mean, again, thinking of the American context, African Americans in the Jim Crow South they certainly face lots of security threats, they certainly face lots of fear, but rather than pushing for a reversal of the social hierarchy, they pushed for civic equality, a universalism for everybody. So why, so, so why is it that those on the lower end of a status distribution sometimes push for equalization, which I would say is the kind of liberal democratic response, and why in other instances, they, they rather than pushing for equalization, push for a flip in the hierarchy? So, and why is it that this group that you're describing responds in this way? Um, and then finally, a th kind of third provocative question, I guess, is, and I noticed the German title is um, Undemocratic Emotions, the, the English title is uh, The Emotions of Populism. I was wondering, to what degree is Netanyahu really a populist? Uh, you know, isn't he just an illiberal authoritarian, just? Um, and by that I mean he's part of the establishment, right? I mean, he, there is no, you know, one good measure of the establishment is, you know, like who could show up to the Harvard Faculty Club? You know, then Donald Trump would not be able to show up to the Harvard Faculty Club. Netanyahu could kind of pass, you know, and so he's part of the establishment. 
Uh, he certainly uses populist tropes and so on. I guess the point, I mean, I don't want to get into kind of what is populism discussion that in some sense is not fruitful, but the reason I bring this up is to say that what this points to a little bit is the sense of major- who is in the majority and who is in the minority. Um, and there's a way in which um, if we call him a populist, um, and I think you said something about majorities being not wanting to live with the minorities, this gives, a, in a sense, a kind of democratic credentials to this movement. And I guess, you know, Likud is not a majority. Um, Donald Trump never won a majority, and their opponents aren't the elites. I mean, they claim that it is, but the, I think, in my view, um, uh, Donald Trump's opponents are the African-American voters in South Carolina who voted for Joe Biden. I mean, so they, they try to go after these people by attacking the elites. And so maybe that is the populist strategy, but in some sense, that's also kind of an authoritarian strategy. Um, so uh, I think I'll end there. One, one final quote. I just love this quote from... Um, on love, uh, which I don't know, you know, as a social, I know about love in my personal life. I don't know love in, as a social scientist, but there's a wonderful quote from um, uh, Steinmeier who, who gives us an understanding, and I'm just curious what you think of this, you know, that love of nation is in some sense le- leads to some trouble. That's sort of part of the point. And so there's this line from a speech from President Steinmeier he made several years ago. He says, Robert, Rabbi Nachman once said, no heart, heart is as broken as a, no heart is as whole as a broken heart. Germany's past is a fractured past with responsibility for murdering of millions and the suffering of millions. That breaks our heart to this day. And that is why I say that this country, Germany, can only be loved with a broken heart. I mean, is there a way of loving your country with a broken heart that is liberal? I guess that would be the last question I'll end on. Thanks. Thank you. Nice. Daniel, I, I think, if there is some material for you to, to <laughs> respond. Indeed. And, um, I'm sure you 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 are prepared to do this. <laughs> so actually, I, I suggest, if you don't mind, that we go in reverse order, uh, because you asked uh, the question about, you know, what can be done. You know, the the kind of what can be done question, to which usually I have no answer whatsoever. Uh, but I prefer to end by saying I have no idea than start like this. Um, um, so is that okay if we if we go in reverse order? And, and you can be selective, of course. Uh, yeah. But, but okay. let's go ahead. So okay. It's absolutely okay. So, um, Danny, I have to say, by the way, that reading your book a few years back was probably one of the impetus behind writing this book. And um, I just say it now. Um, I should have written it in the acknowledgement, but <laughs> I can say it to you now. Um, so why is this happening now? Um, so I don't know. Um, I mean, I have a lot of I don't know answers. Um, I don't know in the sense that it is very difficult to know what is due to the presence of Netanyahu and um, what would have been there anyway. I don't think it's very easy to separate the two. Um, in other words, what you can attribute, and you know, it's not a big man kind of sociology or history, but some characters really do shape, and Netanyahu has had a very peculiar influence on Israel. However, I, I would say that, you know, in the 1990s, Israel went uh, into uh, globalization, and, and it, it underwent globalization extremely rapidly. It went from a quasi-socialist economy and in a matter of less than two decades, uh, Tel Aviv became this uh, city which, where you could, you know, which became incredibly glittery with wealth and power and inter- and and the, 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 the generation of pioneers, the, the Ashkenazi, mostly, of pioneers, in a matter of, again, two decades, became these high-tech entrepreneurs. And so you, you really cannot, I think, in my opinion, you cannot disconnect this profound economic and cultural change and social change of Israel with the ways in which it was then exploited uh, very smartly, I think by the right uh, of Netanyahu. By the way, not all the right, Begin, Menachem Begin, 
ha had some kind of populist overtones in the ways in which he approached the working class Mizrahi Jews, but he was never as divisive as Netanyahu. What, what, this, what uh, um, characterized Netanyahu, and I think that response, that is an answer to one of your other questions, is that Netanyahu was American and he was very close to the Republican Party. He was very close to the Republican Party of Newt Gingrich, which became incredibly aggressive in its strategies about gaining, um, conquering power and holding on to it. There, there is an osmosis between Netanyahu and American political establishment, which no Israeli political leader ever had. So here I have to say, you know, that, um, um, you know, that Netanyahu, I think, was under the influence of the American uh, Republican Party. So th that's that's one thing. Um, then you, I mean, your remark about the trio actor model is very interesting. I never thought of it does, this does way. It makes sense. I, was, I felt like yeah, it was yeah, yeah. Clear. Okay, yeah. No, I mean, I don't know if it makes sense for everybody, but to me, it made perfect yeah. sense. I do think, and this continues, um, the, the answer of why is this happening. I think that um, in Israel, um, if you look at the entire area that Israeli that Israel controls, I include Gaza. Um, the occupied territories and the territories inside the Green Line, there is now a majority of Palestinians. There is no way politicians don't know it. Not only is there a majority of Palestinians, so, you know, uh, Jews are being out, you know, they're, they're, um, they, they are actually in a minority position. In that sense, it resembles a little bit what is happening in the U.S., with the uh, Latinos, but also the Arabs, the Israeli Arabs, the Israeli Arab citizens have been reaching more and more the middle class. They have been joining the ranks of the middle class um, in a way that makes them much more credible competitors to use your language. I didn't think of it when I was writing the book, uh, but your question makes makes me think that it 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 might play a role with Mizrahi that I was not aware of. Maybe uh, I don't know. But then your 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 biggest uh, what I took to be your biggest question is why is it why is it that the working class uh, support the right? And I mean. I hope. I mean, I hoped I had answered this question. I'm, I'm worried now that maybe I didn't uh, say it clearly enough. Although I think it is in the book. The reason why, and again, this could be particular to the Israeli case, the Mizrahi Jews are roughly to to do a shortcut working class. They came from Ar uh, Arab countries. They were treated with a lot of Orientalist contempt. They were also, but added to this was the fact that they were sent to um, things that we call today the periphery, and which very much actually overlaps with what we've seen all over the world. You know, the Brexiters, for example, were people who, uh, uh, you know, or the blue and the red states. Um, so this is not, this was not the intention, but in fact, what has happened is that geographically, they became isolated. And in becoming isolated, they reproduced their failed um, uh, um, social situation uh, without ever having had the possibility of um, coming out of it. But the re that is exactly the question I ask in the book, in the chapter on resentment. The reason why the Mizrahim never espoused a universalist politics was because the, um, the, the party that uh, enabled them realistically to have a representation was a religious party. And this is where politics connects to state institutions. The very fact that in Israel, uh, religion and state are very connected 
In fact, there is no separation of state and religion. On the one hand, religious ultra-Orthodox parties run, have uh, Ashkenazi, have always run legitimately uh, as legitimate uh, parties. And in 1984, Mizrahim figured out that the ways in which their interests would be represented would not be by having a universalist politics. By the way, there was an attempt. There were a few attempts. They were all crushed. Uh, the, there was a party called the Black Panthers, in fact, that, that, that consciously adopted the, uh, uh, the, the name of the party in, the, in America. This was crushed. The only party that was legitimately accepted by, let's say, the establishment was a religious ultra-Orthodox party. So you had a progressive, um, um, I would say, um, um, turn to religion. This party, which is called Shas, was in almost all of the coalitions with the Likud. And what happened is that there was, again, an osmosis, an influence. The Likud and Shas actually started to compete for the same voters. And the Likud also became more religious and, and, and turned to these religious voters. So this is, you know, this is really an example where you see how the supply side in politics really influences the demand. Because these Mizrahi, many of them, were not really religious. They were traditionalists. But these, but Shas actually created a network of schools um, and provided a lot of services because they were completely neglected. And in doing that, it actually almost bought this electorate to it. That's why it's, it's actually, I want to say almost, it's quite simple when you think of it. It's quite simple. Uh, um, uh, so it's the religion and the fact that they were able to um, convincingly defend their interests by providing a network of religious schools where many of these families were assured that their kids had a meal for lunch. This was tremendous for them. Um, so, so that's what happened. And then... Um, Netanyahu, I agree with you, doesn't have the same habitus, you know, as Trump. Obviously, he doesn't. Uh, but I, I still think we should not view as populist only, you know, uh, people who lack completely education. I think populists <laughs> are um, also people who consciously use a strategy and share I mean, I don't know if there is a, you, you know probably this stuff better than I do, but there would, there would have to be a study of the ways in which these leaders share in common the same strategists and advisors and marketers who are advising them to do the same tricks and things all over the world. Arthur Fickelstein notoriously uh, advised Netanyahu in 1999, and he said to him, he said to him in 1999, if you want to win the election, you have to reframe the divide between left and right into a divide between Jews and Israelis. Mm. This was brilliant, and it succeeded entirely. And this was Arthur Finkelstein, the American Arthur Finkelstein. Finkelstein. So um, now let me move to the uh, other. Yeah, and little looking a little bit at the time so that we. <laughs> that yes. can go on to other issues so, as well. So, Christian, um, your remark about real and fictional or um, imaginary emotions, you're absolutely right. I was, I was in, I am, I have been long interested in the category of emotions that's called fictional emotions. You read a book, you see a movie, you know the characters don't exist, and yet you can cry at the end even though you know the characters and the whole thing is false. So I would, I, I am entirely with you in saying that these emotions feel very real. Uh, I think that's the, the, I mean, they're real, but I think I wanted to keep the distinction um, between the two intact. 
which is why, I mean, I interviewed these three women who live really near the Gaza band. <laughs> and they are the ones, they have, they explain to me in great detail how they change their everyday life and how their shelter, that is a very solid kind of construction, has become the center point and they can never go very far from the shelter. They always calculate, they explain to me how they calculate their steps they take from the shelter because at any moment a, 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 a rocket can fall on them. These women were the ones that were the most sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza I, I have ever met, in fact. Um, and they, they would explain to me, first of all, they said, you know, they're incredibly inventive. These balloons that they send, and then, uh, you know, they, they could understand, and, and they were incredibly critical. So I had to account for the ways in which their fear, which amounted to really changing their daily life, was very different from the fear of people who live rather far from, uh, uh, from the real rockets. Um, uh, not to say that the, the, the emotion itself is not real, but its anchor is different. And Yelena, uh, your question about how, I mean, I really loved the way you put it, which is to say that, you know, you said that um, it is a machine that works on constant high emotional arousal. Um, I, I, it's not my expression, I wish it had been. Uh, it's a very nice expression. Um, how do we puncture this? It, it was more about not how, the, the point was more whether it can be punctured. The, the, my sense after reading the book was it cannot be punctured in any kind of normal way. So, I mean, if I, you know, we take the example of Trump, mm. um, I think Trump is, I mean, if I'm not incorrect, uh, I think that some of Trump's followers, I mean, look, I mean, some of Netanyahu's followers and some of Trump's followers uh, are now um, starting to be disenchanted. Mm. Um, the, the thing about populist politics, I think, is that it relies very much on identification with the leader. Uh, there is a kind of emotional investment, which I have not researched in the book, but there is a, a whole sociology of that kind of, you know, Netanyahu was called, has been called for a long time, Netanyahu Melech Israel, King of Israel. And um, there is a kind of emotional investment which make them almost impermeable mm. to not only to anything, but which makes any attack on, on them the proof that they must be defended. And I think this is the kind of emotional dynamic that happens also with Trump. The more they reveal themselves to be uh, corrupt, the more it is a proof that the world is out there to get them. Um, so how do you puncture this? I, I just don't know. Uh, I do know, though, that both Trump and Netanyahu uh, are losing some believers. So I guess, you know, maybe the sociology of religion, I'm, I'm raising this, uh, could be of help here because um, some people believe in them as if they were saviors. They were their personal saviors. Um, and so it could be that, um, as with sects, for example, how do people come uh, become aware that uh, the leader of a sect is not what he pretends to be? Um, it could be that it is relevant here. I'm not sure. Great. Uh, let, me, let me dig in a little bit on the sort of issue that came up now at least two or three times, and that is the question. Netanyahu and Trump, are there similarities or differences, and what is stronger? I mean, if I'm, in reading your book, I would, I would probably think there are two ways to read it. And one way is to say the way the, these emotions that you describe has transformed the country is a specific Israeli 
uh, story. It is a, it is an Israeli thing with the uh, with the conflict in the background, with fear playing a very 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 strong role. Uh, and when you when you list the the four emotions, fear is the first one, essentially starting the process. That's one way to read it, and then it's very much Netanyahu as a sort of a, of a Israeli history. Uh, the other one, of course, is to say, well, this is something that is going on almost everywhere in the in the developed world, that we have uh, a lot of people resenting the developments, re, uh, resentments about minorities because of globalization, because they feel they do not get what they deserve. Um, and, and that would be very much the story that we probably would would use uh, here in Europe and then, of course, also in the US when we talk about uh, Trump. And my question there would be only to, to ask you a little bit more in, in, in separating the two. I mean, would, would Netanyahu be possible without the specific fear background? And uh, if not, why is he different from uh, Trump and all the others? Uh, so that, that would be something where I would like to hear a little bit more from you. Um, would Netanyahu be possible without the fear background? Um, you know, Netanyahu started his career with, um, I mean, he started it before, of course, but in Israel he became really prominent when Rabin was uh, trying to broker peace talks. And already then, in 1994, he was one of the chief inciters showing Rabin um, dressed as a Nazi. Um, the head of the secret services um, then already contacted him personally and told him, listen, uh, we have hot uh, information that if you continue to do this, uh, um, there might be uh, an attempt to murder the prime minister. Uh, it did not dissuade him at all, and he continued um, to do what he apparently knew to do very well. So I think inciting, if I have to look at the career of Netanyahu, was very much uh, inciting by using the tropes of, for example, Nazism. This is what I want to, 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 to say and to refer to. This is something he has done all the time. He referred to Iran as uh, being um, a new, uh, as threatening to annihilate Israel uh, with a new Shoah. I'm not saying Iran is great. I'm not fond of those ayatollahs. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think we should find another language to uh, explain uh, what is the danger. So from the very start, Netanyahu has Nazified his rivals. And, and you know, it, it is in Daniel's book that they have this beautiful analysis of how you turn a rival into an enemy. And Netanyahu has been doing this from the beginning of his career by Nazifying the, uh, the rival. Um, um, and so he started with Rabin, it went on to Iran, and it went on to the Palestinians. Um, um, Netanyahu, I, I'm not exact, I don't like to psychologize uh, political characters, but he seems to have understood that he was very good at it and he just kept doing it. Um, of, of course, it made sense to do that because of the because of the Shoah, I mean, there wouldn't be any sense to Nazify Rabin if the Nazi was not the ultimate demon um, in Israel. Um, so um, and and um, so I would say that historical trauma and the geopolitical situation, and you had you had an you needed an adjuvant. You needed some catalyst to blend all of these uh, together to uh, make it what it has become. In a way, I want to say in this, in this I'm going to 
sing praises to Israel, given the narrative of trauma of the Shoah, given the geopolitical uh, situation of Israel, it's quite astonishing that no one made use earlier uh, uh, and in a cynical way of um, these of this emotion to justify uh, you know whatever decision they wanted to make. It's quite remarkable. Uh, I'm not exactly sure I know how to explain it, but um, but so in in that sense, I think. I think you had the components and then you needed the catalyst to make them work really in this specific way. That catalyst was Netanyahu. Okay. And it was also the sort of um, networks that you talk about, that it is a common, de a common development in many countries at the same time with the Trumps and the Orbans and so on, uh, that made this shift possible. I mean, I will uh, take the questions uh, from you in a second. I would like to have essentially a last round here on, uh, on the panel, and, and I just want to throw out a sort of a question. If you see now all those pictures from Israel with all the protests against Netanyahu, against his, as you put it, attempt for regime change, um, I mean, I feel very emotional when I see these pictures and I see flags of, of Israel and all that. So the, the question is a little bit, is there not um, an, a very successful attempt of using emotions for the right purpose that we currently see uh, in Israel. And if it is so, how can we essentially separate the false or uh, the wrong uh, emotions from the right ones, which we obviously need to have a strong protest movement against regime change? Uh, maybe I start with you, and if you then want to add something, you add something. Eva, you go ahead. And Actually, I would love to know your, okay, then. All, all three, all of you, response to this. I would say you can't really separate. I mean, my, my way of thinking about this question, I, don't, I would not want a la Marta Nussbaum, who wrote a very bad book on this issue, on political emotions, where she says there are good emotions and bad emotions. I don't think you can do that, and I wouldn't want to be the one doing trash and treasure. I think there is always a passionate commitment um, to your opinions and ideas. And you know, I'm not trying to say that the deliberative model of democracy we had is the wrong one. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm saying it a little bit nonetheless. Because we had this view that democracy and the public sphere is about exchanging ideas, trying to build consensus, trying to uh, find the truth together. Um, and of course, this is a model that I subscribe to and very much uh, like. But I don't think you can say that somebody who uh, defends justice uh, um, is devoid of emotions, nor should they. I, th I don't think you can effectively def defend justice without emotions. You should have emotions. You should do it with compassion, with uh, love for the subject or the object you're defending. So I don't think you can, and even you know, resentment, for example, to go back. Resentment is, you know, Pace, Nietzsche, and Scheller, it is a democratic emotion. Um, and I like the attempt by a few American uh, uh, intellectuals to rescue the emotion of resentment. There is a democratic impulse behind resentment, which should be respected and, 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 and heard. So I think in a lot of, of these emotions, the, many of these emotions are ambivalent. Uh, I think we should recognize and ask maybe Ala Chantal Mouffe, you know, how, for example, to mobilize the left. What has been so surprising in what is happening in Israel is that we thought the left to be hedonist um, and detached. And I mean, not that I think it is the left that is in the street. I don't think it is the left. It is some kind of very broad center. But these people have discovered a passionate commitment to something. Uh, that's very valuable. I don't think you can think uh, in, a in, in, in a serious way about 
politics, at least the ways in which traditional theoreticians of democracy thought about politics without thinking about this passion and involvement and commitment. You want to come in? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yep. So I would very much subscribe to this idea that most of these emotions are ambivalent and that the, the issue is how they are being used for which purpose and uh, within which context. And I think if we look at um, each of the sides, we will find a lot of fear, we will find a lot of hatred, we will find a lot of resentment. But the question is, which kind of goal will these emotions uh, will these emotions achieve? And now, when I was looking at the protests, and I was also being kind of um, excited about them, I was thinking, yeah, we need a lot of anger, a lot of anger now here. Um, but I always wonder, um, having kind of lived through one such um, such revolution, I would say, what happens afterwards? What kind of, how do emotions get reconstituted in a way again? So what do we get? Do we get something better? Uh, do we get something worse? And my fear is that once we have uh, populist uh, leaders in powers and once they kind of devastate political spaces, they actually create specific political cultures that are extremely difficult to get rid of, even if populists themselves are removed from power. And this would be my fear going, going into the future. So even if we find some way of getting rid of uh, populists, uh, it is my, and I think it will be extremely difficult with all the social media, AI coming up, and all the things that we will have to uh, grapple, which in essence drive are also, emotions are vehicles of these tools as well. So, so my question would be broader in this sense, what kind of political cultures are, uh, are being left after populist um, and whether, uh, whether this antagonism can ever be reverted to uh, agonism that can facilitate democracy, a polarization that feeds deliberative democracy rather than staying in these states of, of constant annihilation, I would say. All right. okay. um. Yeah, I mean, I would also agree with uh, what Ifa said, that it's not about uh, which emotions are the right ones or the wrong ones, or we have I don't know, democratic or anti-democratic emotions. But for me, it's, it's, it's almost much more about the underlying concerns that give rise to those emotions and which are important or unimportant concerns, or whether people have certain concerns or matters of import. Um, and how they are made salient by political discourse. So I think many of the examples that you bring up in your book point to the fact that political actors are sort of cons not, not just emotion entrepreneurs, but also concerns entrepreneurs. So they, they tell people what should be of concern and import to them. I think a good example of the German case is uh, that pork meat has suddenly become part and parcel of German identity, right? When certain kindergartens or schools stopped uh, stop to serve pork meat, um, it was right-wing populists said, oh, they, they can't possibly stop serving pork meat because pork meat is part of German identity, mm. which is basically nonsense. I mean, no, nobody before that cared about eating pork meat or beef or whatever, but they managed to bring certain things to make them matters of grave concern. And I think that is much more important. And then the second thing is, where are those emotions directed at? Which are, where, where are the scapegoats? Where are the culprits, et cetera, et cetera? And I mean, then again, I just know the German situation where it's on the one hand side, it's the elites and also the working classes or lower middle classes, but then it's also other minorities at which these emotions are directed. So that it, it goes in multiple ways to direct those emotions. And I think that is what we need to look at. Thanks, fantastic. Daniel? Yeah, final thought. Uh, I, I think one way in which we're ill-served is to use, adopt the vocabulary of populists, which is to juxtapose the people in the cosmopolitans. Um, and that, that, that's how the populace would like to create, you know, the cosmopolitans don't have any emotions and emotions are the realm of the populace. And in fact, the people in the streets, as you're saying, the emotion plays a big role on this. And so in some way recognizing that um, there's, there, are, there are emotions that can be used for democratic purposes. And you know, I, I read that quote from Steinmeier and every time I read it, it does, it does something to me. You know, and I'm not quite sure what that is, but, that, but there's a way in which um, 
you know, that the moving scenes can be, I mean, that, that citizens can try to defend their democracy and there's, there's a sense, and, I, and so one, one emotion we haven't talked about is the emotion of despair. And I think that's a dangerous one, right? So the thought that we can't do anything about it. And I think in some ways that's perhaps a, dang a, a dangerous, I don't know if that's one of the bad emotions, but, that's, but the idea that we can control our own lives and that we don't allow others to dominate the political space and the emotional space, I think is key. Great. I think it is time to come to an end and uh, sorry to all of you who had now not a chance to ask a question, but there will be an opportunity outside, as I mentioned in the beginning. Before we end, let me just first of all thank you for, your, for coming and for your attention and of course especially thank you to Eva for writing this book yeah. to us because we wouldn't have a chance to read it. So thank you. And of course, thank you very much to the, to the panelists for, for contributing to this beautiful discussion. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>